I agree with you in prayer. Jesus said, if two of you shall agree about anything to ask, it shall be done by my Father who's in heaven. So we agree right now in the name of Jesus for your breakthrough. We agree for your provision. We agree. Father, we thank you for the provision that you have for each and every one of us. Every person connected here, you are providing, you are protecting, you are empowering. I thank you, Lord, that there will not be one needy one among us for you shall supply all our need according to your riches and glory. I pray for healings, for miracles, for breakthroughs. Father, I thank you that you will satisfy the hunger and the desire of each person. Lord, meet the, the, the critical needs, the loneliness of soul and the emptiness in hands. We just pray that you will fill them both in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to talk to you today about I want to talk to you out of Isaiah chapter 40, verse one. And my teaching today is called your struggle is over. Your struggle is over. I love this verse in Isaiah chapter 40, verse one, because this season in our lives, so many of us are feeling the heaviness of life, the heaviness of the trials in our lives, the heaviness of what's going on in the world. And it can be really hard to find rest. And God gives us this promise in Isaiah 40, verse one, comfort, oh, comfort my people and tell her that her struggle is over. Tell her that her struggle is over. Now, the struggle that we're facing and the struggle that we're that they were dealing with here and the struggle that we've overcome or that Jesus has overcome for us is the struggle to be loved, the struggle to be accepted, the struggle to defeat our enemy, the struggle to move mountains, the struggle to get our faith to work, the struggle to see the promises of God in our lives, the struggle to live godly. These are all the things that people struggle with. And God said, your struggle is over. What you used to have to do in the power of your of your own strength, God gives you the strength. You're going to experience new strength. And I want to talk to you about living in this new strength, living in the spirit of God, living in rest. He says, Isaiah 40, verse one, comfort ye my people, comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to her that her warfare has ended. One translation says the New American Standard, her warfare has ended. Her iniquity has been removed and she has received of the Lord's hand double for all of her sins, double for your trouble. That's what God offers here. And what is this? This is speaking to how we cannot have our we cannot cleanse ourselves of our sins without the blood of Jesus. We cannot achieve salvation. We cannot achieve righteousness. We cannot achieve the promises of God through our own efforts, but we can come and find rest in knowing that Jesus did it all for us. We can come and breathe a sigh of relief that Jesus came in his first coming as we celebrate, begin the celebration of the advent, the first coming of Jesus. We have to realize that Bethlehem represents God with us, Emmanuel, God with us, right? Calvary represents God for us, God for us. The finished work of the cross is for us. And then Pentecost represents God in us. So God with us, God for us and God in us. And this is why so many of us struggle in our walk with God. We're trying to do it for God rather than realizing that he's doing it in us. He's doing it with us, for us and in us. And the whole concept of the Holy Spirit living inside of us is that he gives us the power to live victoriously. He gives us the power to experience the promises of God. He gives us the power to find peace. He gives us the power to have rest. He gives us the power to have joy. See, it's an in, it's a it's an inside job. As it said, we we have to realize that the work of the spirit is the work inside of us by simply inviting the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. He does the work. He transforms us. He changes us from day to day. Comfort my people, the comfort, the, the sigh of relief, the the ability to rest comes from knowing that your struggle is over. Your struggle with sin is over. Jesus did it all. 
the cross put an end to the struggle. You see what the Holy Spirit is really wanting to do in your life and what he's really wanting to to bring to pass in your life is he's trying to awaken you. The Holy Spirit, his job is to give us revelation. His job is to convince us. The, the scripture uses the word the Holy Spirit will convict us, but the word is the actual word is the word convince. The Holy Spirit will convince us of what's true. He will convince us of what Jesus already said. He will convince us of what Jesus has already done. I really want you to get a hold of this, that the Holy Spirit is in your life to, to bring to pass what God has promised and to to assure you, to give you the assurance, the conviction, the confidence, the convincing that God will keep his promises because he's faithful. He's not waiting for us to do something in order for him to keep his promises. He will keep his promises because he is faithful. Now, listen, this is why when he says comfort my people and tell her that her struggle is over, the struggle to overcome the struggle to be the head and not the tail, the struggle to win, the struggle to succeed, the struggle. This is all paid for at the cross. Jesus did it all. All we need to do is believe it, receive it and experience it and rejoice in it because the devil realizes that he cannot defeat Christians by trying to get them to hate God. So he defeats them. Listen to how the devil works. He defeats people by tempting them to try to defeat their problems themselves, to defeat sin themselves, to try to overcome themselves. You see, if we really knew what religion is, is this man's efforts. It's man trying to prove that he can reach God so that he gets the glory for what he did to achieve and to reach God. But that's not Christianity. That's religion. But Christianity is God coming and reaching us and God getting the glory because he's the one that found us. We were the ones lost and he found us. But I think every one of us would be frustrated if we try and try to have something that we already have. And when Jesus goes to the cross, he pays for all of God's promises to become yours. Why is this so important? Because in life, the way we fight, the way we prevail in life is with the promises of God. The way that we find comfort is with the promises of God. The way we find joy is with the promises of God. The promises of God bring rest. The promises of God bring peace. The promises of God bring pleasure. The promises of God bring wisdom. The promises of God bring breakthrough. But when we think that God's promises are attached to our efforts, that God will keep his promise if we really try hard. Well, then at what point have we tried hard enough? At what point have we done enough? If God will respond to us and God will keep his promises because we try, if God will keep his promises because we're strong and we're faithful, at what point are we truly faithful enough? At what point have we really held on long enough? You see, I believe that it's not up to us to have to try to hold on long enough. It's God holding on to us. It's not us trying to keep our promises or get God to keep his promises, but it's God watching over his word to perform it. God watching over his word to fulfill what he has promised. Wow. You know, the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14 is called the comforter in verse 16 and verse 26. He's the comforter in verse in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, he delivers us from oppression. He heals us from oppression. And how does he do that in our lives? Because he comes to live inside of us. When we get born again, he comes. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us and he comforts us. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. and We're not alone anymore. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us and we don't have to try to make it through life by ourselves anymore. As I mentioned earlier, it is God. Bethlehem is God with us. Calvary is God for us and Pentecost is God in us. This is why your struggle is over. This is why the reason why I announced to you today, like out of Isaiah 40, I announced to you today, your struggle is over. Your warfare is over. He said, I thought we were in spiritual warfare. Yes, but the spiritual warfare is the war against thinking that we still have to go to war. 
it's the, the warfare that we really, the true spiritual warfare is really fighting the fight of faith, fighting the fight to believe it is finished, fighting the fight to believe the finished work of the cross is enough, that Jesus did enough. You know, there's this little book in the Bible called the book of Philemon. And I want to read this verse to you, Philemon. It's very powerful. It says, and your faith becomes effective or your faith becomes effectual or your faith has results through acknowledging what is already in you, the good that is already in you in Christ Jesus. Notice what he says there, that your faith is activated, that your faith has an impact, that your faith actually is put to use by acknowledging what is already in us in Christ Jesus. This is what brings us rest to understand what God has given us to do inventory, as I said a couple or a few weeks ago, to take inventory that what's inside of us, the spirit of God's inside of us. He's given us his spirit. He's given us his promises. He's given us his power. He's given us his love. He's given us his faith. He's given us his wisdom. He's given us his righteousness. He's given us his healing. He's given us his his mind, the mind of Christ. We have this is why so many Christians struggle because they don't understand this. They struggle to try to be right with God, to pray hard enough, to do enough, to get, go to just be faithful enough that God will maybe answer. Or God will maybe smile or God will maybe say good job. But we don't have to live like that. This is why so many Christians are struggling. They might ne they might never admit it, but there are millions of Christians who are disillusioned with their version of Christianity, what the church promised, what religion promised on the authority of God's word. People have told us and religion has told us and even church has told us that you can that you can have strength, you can have joy, you can have fellowship with God, you can have a life of peace in the midst of turmoil. But those promises never materialized. So many of us tragically burn with this anger at God. Have you ever been angry at God because you feel that he didn't fulfill his promise? He shortchanged you. It feels like God advertised his kingdom in the Bible, but failed to follow through. I know that I know what it's like to feel that way because I felt like that until I understood the goodness of God, until I started looking for the goodness of God, until I discovered the grace of God until I realized I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. You see, most burned out believers would testify that they set on this path of faith with a pep in their step and high hopes with joy filled that it was going to be a joy filled walk with God. Then at some point in their faith, their joy evaporated because the promises of God that looked like a oasis that appeared to be a mirage. We struggle and struggle to get back to where we were when we were on fire for God. But then we give up and we just follow motion, religious motions while we live in despair. Listen, I believe most frustration in our life and despair is caused by a basic misunderstanding of the nature of God and his promises that most of us are frustrated in life because we we have a we have a misunderstanding of what a promise from God really is. You see, many people look at a promise from God that God will supply all your needs or you can be healed by the blood of Jesus, whatever the promise of God is. There's seven thousand of them, right? But so many people have a misunderstanding and they see a promise from God as a challenge to you. Have you ever thought that like God's promise is a challenge for you to do the things necessary to get the promise? That's what traps us in despair. That's what sidetracks us. That's what gives us. That's what, that's what causes us to be so weary. This is what causes us to to give up. The truth is that faith and the promises of God don't rest 
in our ability to do what God promised or in our ability to somehow get God to keep his promise. Our faith cannot be any longer in what we can do to get God to keep his promise. Our faith can't be in what in, in if we can twist God's arm. He doesn't need his arm twisted. He's already convinced he already loves you. He already wants to do you good. He already wants to fulfill his promise to you. In First Corinthians two, verse five, it says how our faith should really work. It says that your faith should not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, that your faith would not rest in the wisdom of men. I like what it says in First Corinthians two, five in the New Living Translation. I did this so you would trust not in human wisdom, but in the power of God, our trust. The reason we don't rest is because our trust is in our ability to get God to try to convince God to answer our prayer, try to convince God that we're good enough, try to convince God to do it rather than simply realizing he's already convinced. And all we need to do is put our faith in his power. First Corinthians one says the cross is the power of God. The cross is the power of God. So when your faith rests in the power of God, like he says in first Corinthians one or two, five, when your faith rests in the in the power, in this case, when your faith rests in the power of God, the power is in the cross. The power is in the fact that it is finished. Rest comes when we put our faith in what Jesus has done, not in us trying to get God to keep his promise. Boy, if we would get this, that Christianity is not about the promises we make to God, but the promises he makes to us. If we really get a hold of this, instead of saying, oh, man, this is how most people. This is how most people's relationship with God is like, man, God, I promise I'm going to pray more. I promise I'm going to do more. I promise I'm going to avoid more temptation. I promise I'm going to get up early and I promise I'm going to you know, be better. We make all these promises and that's why we're wiped out. That's why we're weary. That's why we get frustrated and want to quit. That's why I'm here to announce to you your struggle is over. You see, if I could put it to you this way, that simple faith for all of us is explained in the, the story of Abraham and Isaac and Ishmael. Remember, in Genesis chapter 15, God leads Abraham outside of his tent and he shows him the stars in the sky and he says, Abraham, count the stars if you're able. That's how many descendants you're going to have. Now, at the time that God said this, he didn't have any children at all. But God said, go in Genesis 15, go count, go count the stars. Can you count them, Abraham? That's at the, at, a, at the time his name was Abram. God changed his name later to Abraham. But the point is, is that he said to Abram, count the stars if you're able. That's how many descendants you're going to have. I'm going to multiply you like the stars in the sky. I'm going to multiply you like the sands in the seashore. Like I'm going to multiply you in ways that you cannot even imagine. That's that was God's promise to Abraham. Then several years went by and the promise hadn't happened yet. What was so vivid to Abraham in the early time, suddenly it's not as vivid anymore. He's 80 something years old now. By this time, Sarah's, you know, in her 70s and 80s now, Sarah's been waiting for the promise and she she just thought it was absurd that it had taken so long. I bet she felt hurt inside because she couldn't have a child. I bet she felt unfulfilled inside. She, God had made this promise. You got you guys are going to have a child. God made this promise. You guys are going to have a child and you're going to have descendants as much as the stars in heaven. And then it didn't happen. Years went by and it didn't happen. So what did Abraham and Sarah do or Abram and Sarai, which was their names before God changed them. 
they decided to take matters into their own hands. And Sarai grabs her servant girl, this Egyptian girl, Hagar, and offers her to Abram, his, her husband, and says, have a child with her. And that'll be how God fulfills his promise. And guess what happened? They had Ishmael and Abram and Sarah both thought this is how God will give us the promise. This is how God will give. will give God a hand. We'll help God fulfill his promise by having this baby through Hagar. And what did they give birth to? They gave birth to Ishmael. And what does Ishmael mean? Ishmael, the word Ishmael means struggle. And they gave birth to a struggle. They misunderstood. They had interpreted God's promise as a challenge to them rather than realizing that what a promise from God is, it's an announcement of what God's going to do. You know, as Christmas comes up, if you promised your kid a new computer or you promised your kid a car, or you promised your kid a bike or whatever it is, whatever you promise to give to your child on Christmas is not a challenge to your child to make sure that your child finds a way to get that bike or get that computer or get that new cell phone. It's not if you make a promise to your child, your child shouldn't have to jump through hoops to get you to fulfill your promise. All that child should do is look with expectation towards December 25th. Remember when you were a kid, when we were kids and the Christmas Eve, we could barely sleep. But if we went to sleep, wake up at three or four in the morning to see if the presents were there underneath the tree. It wasn't the kids having to do anything to get the parents to put the tree, to put the gifts under the tree. It wasn't a challenge to your kid to be good enough to get a Christmas gift. If it's not, if it's something that they have to earn, it's no longer a gift. If God makes a promise to us, but we have to earn it, it's no longer a promise. It's pay. It's God paying us for something the same way that a, that God, that a parent promises a child, this is what I'm going to get you for, for Christmas. And the child just wakes up in the morning and receives it. That's how God wants our relationship with him to be, that it was that it will no longer be that the Christian life will no longer be a challenge for you to have to try to get God to do what he said he would do. But from now on, it would be you hearing God's promise as an announcement that he's going to do it. You see, the Christian life is not this massive effort to struggle to achieve God's will, but rather it's to rest helplessly in the character and faithfulness of God, that he who promised is faithful. You know, if you think about it like this, there's really only two religions in this world. One is the religion of doing, 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 which takes in every world religion, including some forms of Christianity that are all about what you do, what you can do to get God to fulfill his promises. So there's the religion of doing. You got to do, do, do. And all that creates is a bunch of do, do. But you understand the point. You got to the two religions in this world, the religion of doing and the religion of resting. It's not anything in the middle. It's it's not it's not a mixture. It's it's one or the other. It's a religion of doing. You have to do something to get God to love you. You have to do something to get God to keep his promises. You have to do something to get God to like you. You have to do something to get God to approve of you. That's the religion of doing or Jesus did it all. And you now enter into a religion of rest. And I don't even and I use that word religion lightly, but it's a it's a religion of relationship and rest, resting in what God has done, 
resting in what God said he will do. So the two religions, the religion of doing versus the religion of resting. One is a list of rules that we try to keep, keep those rules as we struggle to achieve all that God promised. Or the other is the one that was announced by angels saying that God will come and dwell among man, that God will come and be Emmanuel, that God will come and he will be your father and you will be his child. For many of us, you know, all of our devotion, all of our struggles to make the scriptures come to pass in our lives makes us miserable. The joy of the Lord turns to despair. We're supposed to be connected to the spirit, but instead we're enslaved to keeping all the rules so that we can get God to keep his promises. That's the Ishmael lifestyle. It's a lifestyle of struggle versus the Isaac lifestyle when God actually fulfilled the promise and Abraham and Sarah had Isaac. Ishmael means struggle. Isaac means laughter. You see, it's a choice. What we're going to believe, are we going to believe that a relationship with God is a struggle to produce Ishmael and to produce a struggle that we just struggle with for the rest of our life? Or do we choose this relationship where it's almost too good to be true. And it's like God did it all for us. And all we have to do is rest and trust and love one another. That's too. That's too easy. But God, but Jesus did say in the most one of the most famous passages of scripture in Matthew, chapter 11, verse 28, come to me all who are weary, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm humble and gentle of heart and you will find rest for your souls. The gospel is the promise of rest in Christ. It's the promise of resting in that you have a secure relationship with God that you can grow in but you will never lose this relationship with God because it's not a relationship built on keeping rules. It's a relationship that where Jesus put our hand in the hands of God, Jesus took our hand and put our hand in the hand of the father. And from this moment forward, this Christian life can be a life of peace and rest and joy. Yes, trials, there will be trials, there will be fire, there will be temptation, there will be frustration. But most of that frustration goes away when we rest in what Jesus has already done in Jeremiah chapter 31. I'll close with this passage. He says, I will put my law within them. Verse 33 and 34 and on their heart, I will write it. I will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall not teach again. Each man his neighbor and each man, his brother saying, "Know the Lord for all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. But if we just pause to realize that God is making four promises there for us, not a not challenging us to dedicate our lives to make sure these things happen, but he's dedicating his life to make sure that these things happen. He says, I will write the word on their heart. I will be their God. They shall be my people. You will know me from the least to the greatest, and I will forgive your sins and remember them no more. Think about those four things for a moment. He says, number one, I I will write the word on their heart like it's no longer just reading a list of things, but God writes it on our heart and it becomes something very natural for us to trust him because he kept his promise and he's keeping his promises. I'll write the word on their heart. I will be their God and they shall be my people. 
It's a promise. I, I will write the word on your heart. I will be your God. You shall be my people and you will know me. You will know me from the least to the greatest. You don't have to achieve some great status so that you can know me. He said, you will know me from the least to the greatest. And he says, I will forgive. And remember your sins no more. That's the gospel. I invite you to not only have this be the beginning of your relationship with God, but have this be what sustains you in your relationship with God. He's doing the writing on your heart. He's making you his child and he your heavenly father. He's making you to know him. You will know him and I will forgive your sins and remember them no more. Boy, if you're watching today and you've never been at a place where you knew that your sins were forgiven, why not receive that now? It's only through Jesus that you can have that anyway. His blood washes away our sins. Just pray this. Just say, Heavenly Father, I receive Jesus Christ. Just say that I receive Jesus Christ as my savior. I believe Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead from this moment forward. Just say that out loud from this moment forward. I am a child of God. It's that simple. And now begin this journey. What is this journey? It's not a journey of rule keeping. It's a journey of relationship with God through Jesus. If you just prayed that prayer, make sure to get this book, The Power of a New Life. It's, you can download this anywhere in the world. Absolutely free. I want it. I want to give it to you as your gift. It will teach you the next steps, so to speak, in this journey and in this relationship with God. And I congratulate you if you prayed that prayer. Please let me know. I want to hear from you. And now we move forward in this season by trusting God and by choosing not a religion of rules, a religion of bondage, a religion of do, do, do. But we choose a religion of rest because Jesus promised it and we simply receive it. Amen. God bless you. Have a beautiful rest of your day. And I can't wait to see you at our next service. God bless